Hello and welcome everyone to our lecture 18 of BIS 103, our last lecture for this quarter. And what we want to do is actually don't we want to end at the beginning, biochemically speaking. We want to talk about photosynthesis and the Kelvin cycle. And so at all quarter we had discussed about how we can use glucose and other sugars how we can break them down for generating chemical energy in form of ATP. We had talked about many of the other breakdown reactions from fatty acids and from amino acids. And we had talked about how we can return some of these reactions from common metabolites to generate amino acids, fatty acids, and our carbohydrates. But what we didn't talk about is where this glucose that we started out with right in our lectures one and two where that actually originally comes from, again, biochemically speaking, and that's photosynthesis and the Kelvin cycle. So the capacity of using light energy to generate carbohydrates, specifically glucose. That's what we want to focus on today. So we're completing our map here by going to the very beginning and looking at where that glucose that we talked about all quarter actually comes from, how it is produced in photosynthetic organisms. So our learning goals for today are that we want to be able to describe the major, the key processes of photophosphorylation. And we want to do so by comparing it to our oxidative phosphorylation that we did in the ETC. As part of this, we want to be able to give some examples of the key photosynthetic electron carriers, be able to describe their function, again, comparing them to the electron carriers that we already had discussed when we talked about the ETC. And then we will end on being able to explain the processes of the Kelvin cycle, how it is connected to the photosynthetic light reaction, and what its relevance is for glucose biosynthesis. Again, I have broken it up into two videos here. The first one where we will speak mostly about these two first learning goals, we'll look at the light reactions. And then in the second video, I will go over the mechanisms of the Kelvin cycle. So again, right, this quarter, we spent almost all of our time on talking about how we can utilize carbohydrates here, glucoses, and oxygen, how we can use those to generate chemical energy. Right? We had talked about all our catabolic pathways. We had talked about how we need to breathe in oxygen as our final electron acceptor of the ETC, allowing us to produce ATP. And today we want to turn it around. We want to look at how we can actually use carbon dioxide, right, the product of our decarboxylation reactions that we're breathing out and the water that we are generating in our ETC, how, we can, how that can be used by autotroph photosynthetic organisms to actually generate carbohydrates and oxygen. And so I think it's really profound to think about this, that these two organismal concepts are inherently linked to each other Right? Our consumption of oxygen, our consumption of carbohydrates as heterotroph organisms is directly linked to the water that we are producing, the carbon dioxide that we're producing in our catabolic, in our decarboxylation reactions is used by photosynthetic organisms to generate this chemical energy. So I think it's always important to keep in mind that those two systems are inherently linked to each other in nature. So when we talk about photosynthesis, we really have to divide it up into two reactions. There's the light reactions and the dark reactions. They happen in the chloroplast, and we look at that a little bit later. And so your first part here would be the light reactions, which essentially is a light-driven electron transport chain. We're using light energy and we're using water to generate electron carriers. In this case here, we're generating NADPH. Right? We already had um, seen NADPH before, and we're generating ATP exactly the same way through the ATP synthase as we had seen for our um, ETC in the mitochondria. What we're generating is a byproduct here, and we'll see how that works, is oxygen. Right? So these reactions are entirely light dependent. You need light energy to trigger this electron transfer here. So that's why they're called the light reactions. And then on the other side, we have the dark reactions or the light independent reactions, 
And these are now using the ATP and the NADPH that we generated in the light reactions to generate sugars. We're bringing in as a secondary substrate here carbon dioxide. And so this is our Kelvin cycle where we can actually use that light driven ATP production to generate sugars. They're called light independent reactions here because they do not need direct sunlight to trigger the and run the Kelvin cycle. But keep in mind, right, the Kelvin cycle would not operate unless we actually have the ATP and the NADPH that is generated in the light reaction. So it's, it can be a bit misleading to think of it as not being dependent on light at all. It's just that the specific reactions do not need light to run. What we want to start out with here is our light reactions now. So the photophosphorylation using light energy to bring about the phosphorylation of ADP to produce ATP. And again, we want to do so by actually looking at some of the commonalities and differences between the system of photophosphorylation and the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, right? Where we had used a number of redox reactions to bring about this electron transfer. So the good news is actually many of the systems, this chemical logic is very similar to what we already had discussed in the ETC, but we're using some different components. So just sort of starting with an overview here, right? what we want to do is we want to use light energy to generate chemical energy in form of ATP and NADPH here. So unlike our ETC, we're using NADPH and that energy trapped in the electron carrier and then the ATP can ultimately be used to generate carbohydrates and ultimately other metabolites. And those pathways then function exactly the same way as we had discussed throughout the entire quarter. So the first step here is a light dependent ETC, essentially. Right? So we're using light in form of photons. That light will be absorbed by small molecules that we call pigments. And so this absorption can now trigger the transfer of electrons and will create a proton motive force, right, a PMF. That PMF can drive the ATP synthase, much as we had discussed in the ETC lectures. And so the, the chemical logic is really the same as in the mitochondrial ETC in oxidative phosphorylation. So if you now compare the two to each other, considering that they are so similar in the biochemical strategy that they are applying, we have to see that they're using actually quite different components. Right? Firstly, the electron donor actually differs. Right in our mitochondrial ETC, we had talked about how we are bringing in NADH and FADH2 from all our catabolic pathways. These are our electron donors. In case of the light dependent ETC in photosynthesis, we are actually using water. And that's intriguing again to think about the linkage between the two because if you remember, right, our final acceptor in the mitochondrial ETC was oxygen, we actually generated water. So that water, biochemically speaking, can now be used in the light dependent ETC as a donor there. There are some organisms that actually use H2S. There are very few, they're usually um, bacteria, so often bacteria that live in very sulfur rich environments, so volcanic areas like Yellowstone, Lassen, and so forth you would find a few organisms that use H2S instead of water as the electron donor. And then your electron acceptor also is different, right? Again, in our mitochondrial ETC, we used oxygen. Here, we're actually using NADP plus as our acceptor, generating the reduced equivalent now, NADPH. And then also our intermediate electron carriers, right? So all the molecules, that are part of the electron transfer reactions are different, right? We had spoken in the mitochondrial ETC about our CoQ and all our different complexes and how they carry these different iron sulfur clusters. They carry henes and they carry copper sulfate, all these different one electron carriers that are part of the complexes and that are critical for the electron transfer. This is different in the light dependent ETC where we have plastokinon, you can already imagine that's equivalent to CoQ, right? It's just a different molecule, but it has a very, very similar function. And then 
our one electron carrier, there are multiple, but the major one that we want to look at is ferriduxin. So again, similar systems of two and one electron transfer reactions, but we're using different molecules, different carrier. But at the end, the chemical logic again is the same. We're using this electron transfer to generate the PMF that drives the ATP synthase. And so this now, bringing this electron transfer about by light energy is called photophosphorylation. So you want to compare this to substrate level phosphorylation, right? Remember using the hydrolysis of high energy compound to bring about the phosphorylation of ADP to make ATP, as we had seen it in our reactions of glycolysis and our oxidative phosphorylation here that we had seen in the mitochondrial ETC, where we're using electron rich carriers to facilitate this electron transfer through reduction oxidation reactions to bring about the same generation of the PMF. So these are the three types of phosphorylation, photophosphorylation, oxidative phosphorylation, and substrate level phosphorylation that really all organisms are using to bring about the generation of ATP as chemical energy. We go. So now that we understand the chemical logic and have started to compare the, the biochemical components between these different systems, especially the mitochondrial um, ETC and the photophosphorylation ETC, let's have a look at where it's actually happening, right? And so let's start with just recapping broadly at least how this worked in the mitochondria, right? So here I have sort of drawn out very schematically a mitochondrium. You have your outer membrane right here, right? You have your inner membrane, sort of this invagination that we said. It helps to increase the surface area of this inner membrane. Right? You have your inner membrane space right here, so the space between the two membranes. And then on the inside here, the cytosolic part of the mitochondria, the matrix. And now if you remember, right, how this ETC worked there is, right, we have your electron transfer chain very simplified here just in blue. That is now using these oxidation reactions to bring about the electron transfer that's coupled to pumping protons from the matrix into this inner membrane space. Right? So from the inside, biochemically speaking, in terms of the proton motor force, right, we're pumping from the inside protons into the outside here. And so those protons now, the gradient, in the concentration of these protons now in the biochemically speaking, the outside in the inner membrane space is flowing back through the ATP synthase for our generation of ATP. Right. So just what we had covered in our two lectures on the ETC in the mitochondria. We had touched at least briefly also on our prokaryotes, right? How it worked there. A little bit more simpler because they don't have organelles, right? You have essentially your outer membrane you have your plasma lemma membrane. I'm just drawing it here in these same invaginations just to highlight the comparison. Oftentimes the plasma membrane is really much more closer to this outer membrane in reality. But for purpose of illustration, I show it similar here. And again, right, we had our ETC here. We have our biochemical in, we're pumping protons out into the space between the plasma membrane, the outer membrane, they're flowing back in and we can make ATP. So very similar system, right? Now we want to look at how this works for the ETC of our photophosphorylation. So we have to look at the chloroplasts as a site of phosphorylation. Right? They look a little bit differently, right? We have again, our outer membrane here. We have our inner membrane, our inner membrane space. But then what is different is actually we have a suborganelle here with its own membrane. It's called the thylakoid. And so I'm just illustrating here, there are many stacks of the thylakoids in the chloroplast. They have their own membrane. And so we have actually the membrane here that's called the thylakoid membrane. And then again, the cytosolic part of the thylakoids is called the lumen. And that now is 
are chemically speaking equivalent to the mitochondrial inner membrane space and we'll see why in a moment and then the cytosolic part of the chloroplast itself outside the um, thylakids that's called the stroma and that's equivalent to the mitochondrial matrix and that's because of where the etc and atp synthesis is actually localized in the chloroplast and it's actually localized in the membrane of the thylakids so not in your inner membrane here as in the uh, mitochondria it's actually sitting in the thylakoid membrane and so biochemically speaking right we're now pumping protons from the stroma into the lumen so our stroma becomes the in our lumen becomes the biochemical out we're pumping protons out they're flowing back so the atp synthase this system is exactly the same we're pumping them into the stroma generating atp and that's because if we are comparing right what is biochemically the in and outside with respect to where we're pumping the protons right we're pumping the protons not into the inner membrane space we're pumping them into the lumen and that's because that's why um, the lumen actually biochemically is the mitochondrial inner membrane space and the stroma which is our biochemical in from where we're pumping the protons becomes our mitochondrial matrix the reason I compare all three of them here is actually that following the endosymbiotic hypothesis is what, and there is a lot of genetic and biochemical evidence that this actually has occurred, is that the way the thylakids have come about and the photophosphorylation has come about is by heterotrophic organisms actually taking up photosynthetic prokaryotes, right, with these two membranes here, and so they can have engulfed them and this would have brought about the evolution of these thylakids. So essentially taking a heterotrophic cell, taking up this photosynthetic prokaryote, and this would become your chloroplast. And so that's, you can see all these biochemical comparisons that are part of the evidence for this hypothesis. All right, so now that we know where this is actually occurring, we can dive into a little bit of the details. Before I do so, Please keep in mind, right, photophosphorylation is not replacing our mitochondrial ETC and glycolysis. They are working in tandem with each other, right? So in a plant cell, you would have, right, your chloroplast right here where photophosphorylation, so photosynthesis in the Kelvin cycle will occur. But, right, you also have your mitochondria. This is where your oxidative phosphorylation in the ETC will occur. And you have, of course, your um, substrate level phosphorylation, the glycolysis in the cytosol. So photophosphorylation is not replacing the other phosphorylation types. They're working in tandem. And the point here really is that we're using photophosphorylation here in the chloroplasts to make sugars. And the ATP we're generating here is almost entirely used to make sugars in the chloroplast. Those sugars then can undergo glycolysis in the cytosol and our downstream products of that can go into the mitochondria, undergo our typical oxidative phosphorylation, so the ETC, to make the ATP that we're using for biochemical work. Okay. So the ATP that we're making now in our light reactions is not used for biochemical work outside of making sugars for the Kelvin cycle. All the other biochemical work is using ATP that is generated in our oxidative phosphorylation. Right? So that's an important concept to keep in mind. All right, let's start looking into these light reactions and let's start looking at some of the key players. Right? What are these key molecules that enable photosynthetic organisms to actually use light energy to drive an electron transfer? And first, we have to sort of look at some physics, right? We have to think about how can it actually work. So light absorption by these molecules, by these pigments, creates good electron donors. And it does so by putting electrons in these pigments into an excited state, right? So that means we're putting them into an outer orbital. So you, right, you would have your ground state here. You may remember that from your physics lectures. You have your electrons sitting right here. And now you can use the energy of light of a photon to push this electron into an outer ring. That's a ring now where this electron has less energy in this 
um, atom. And so this is a more excited state. It's more easily now transferred over to another molecule. Right? So this is the, the physical principle that we're using here to drive this electron transfer. So the first step is by pushing electrons into an outer orbital so they can be easier, more easily transferred to another molecule. The molecule in question here, our major pigment, the key player is chlorophyll and specifically chlorophyll A. And so this pigment is located into two different photosystems. So these are proteins that bind both these pigments as well as the electron carriers and can absorb light energy through these bound pigments. We have two photosystems, they're called photosystem one or PS1, based on the um, wavelengths of light that is required here for bring it into the excited state. It's called also P700. And then we have photosystem two or PS2 that is correspondingly to the light energy needed called P680. And so if you look at some of these pigments, right, they actually have different colors, which makes sense if you think about, right, them absorbing light. So your major ones here are these green ones here, chlorophyll A and B. But I also want to highlight that we have a number of other pigments, like these ones here. These are carotenoids in, in yellow, for example. They have slightly different properties, and that allows them to actually use different wavelengths. It allows photosynthesis to actually make use of a broader range of wavelengths. And we'll see that in a bit more detail. And just again, for sort of putting this into um, perspective now, hey, this is actually the crystal structure that has been elucidated for our photosystem two. And you see all these helices here, they're embedded in the membrane of the thylakoid. And then a bit small here in green, you can see all these chlorophyll molecules in green embedded in these helices. They are now your protein bound pigments. This is what chlorophyll actually looks like. Right? On the left here in a space field, so you have this big ring here and then a long hydrocarbon tail. Right? We had already seen something like this when we talked about CoQ, right? It had this hydrocarbon tail that is very hydrophobic. And then it had a functional head group. This allows it to bind well to these proteins and to be embedded in the membrane. For um, the concept, we can also really nicely compare it now to our hemes. Right? We had talked about our electron carriers, the hemes in the mitochondrial ETC, but also right as part of your hemoglobin in blood. And so we had talked about right the key part of this heme being the centric iron atom, right? That is complex within this porphyrin ring here. And then back then I had mentioned right this iron complex in the porphyrin is what makes the heme red. And now if you compare this actually to chlorophyll, it's very, very similar. There's some differences in the substituents of this porphyrin ring here, but the real key difference between the heme and chlorophyll is the metal that we have complex in the porphyrin ring here. It is not iron, it's magnesium. And this has contributes a lot to the fact that chlorophyll isn't red, it's green. So it's largely, we're using the same chemical logic of the structure here. In case of the heme, it was iron. Here we're using magnesium. And so this is a bit more detail. I will not ask you to exactly remember the structure or be able to recognize it. You should be able to compare it to heme and what the differences are here, the major differences. This is just to illustrate for you that there are different chlorophyll variants and they differ in these different rest groups here that are attached to the porphyrin ring. So that is the difference between chlorophyll A and B and then bacteria, photosynthetic prokaryotes have slightly different chlorophyll molecules, but again, there are minor differences here that have to do with enzyme specificity and so forth in these complexes, but you don't really have to focus on that. Right? All of them are using the centric magnesium atom as key part of the molecule. Okay. So what they do is, right, they are pigments, they're absorbing light. And so if you actually look at chlorophyll absorption and the spectra, it mostly will absorb the sort of blue and red light area here, the, the um, violet area, and it will to some degree also absorb in the far red and orange light qualities and wavelengths. 
but the wavelengths specifically in the green and light yellow areas, so those wavelengths are not absorbed by chlorophyll, they're reflected, right? And that's actually why leaves appear green to us, because they're not, the chlorophyll in the chloroplasts in the leaf are not absorbing the green light qualities, so they're reflected, that's why they're green. And then, right, that brings us to some of these other pigments. So I'd already mentioned these types of carotenoids here, lutein, vitaxanthin, neoxanthin. These look yellow oranges. So you have them in all your vegetables that look orange, right? That's actually these pigments. This is what they look like, right? They're very similar to chlorophyll in a way. What they actually are, they're essentially porphyrin rings that are open, right? So these are very hydrophobic. This is similar to the hydrophobic tail of chlorophyll. And then you have these rings here and these conjugated double bonds here allow you to interact with the photons and reflectrons. So this is actually vitamin A. This is also very important for you, for your eyesight. Um, also, right, you're not doing photosynthesis, but it's still important for you. It's a precursor for important molecules that are helping with your eyesight. Now what these guys do, right, you can already imagine from their color, they probably have um, relationships that are different in terms of how they absorb and reflect light in different wavelengths of light. And indeed, those carotenoids here and some of these other compounds here, they are actually now absorbing primarily in this green and light yellow um, wavelengths areas of light quality. And so they are overcoming the deficiency of chlorophyll to absorb in, in these wavelengths between five and 600 and really help to use almost the entire spectrum of light wavelength of light quality to use it for photosynthesis more efficiently. That's one of their functions. Carotenoids actually have many functions, but this is a major one. And so again, right, you can think about it from how it relates to reflecting light. Actually, right, in the fall, when chlorophyll is being degraded, when plants are getting ready to shed their leaves for the winter time, they're actually degrading all the chlorophyll. They're taking back all the breakdown products and use them for energy and for storage of energy. The carotenoids are much harder to break down, so they stay behind for longer. And this is actually what turns your leaves red and yellow, right? So the chlorophyll is being broken down, so the leaf is now less reflecting the green light qualities. Now only the carotenoids stay behind, right? And so now you have more reflection in the yellow and red areas here. And this is actually what makes your leaves turn. This is the biochemical principle underlying your Indian summer. Right? It's a change of pigments and what light qualities are reflected in a leaf, depending on what pigments are predominant. All right, now that we understand this principle of these pigments, right, how they can use light energy, we want to look at how this electron transfer actually works biochemically, right? We are biochemists, we want to understand how this works. And so we have to go back to this idea of right, using photons to excite a molecule to put the electrons into an outer orbital so that it is less tightly bound and can more easily be transferred. And so we're actually starting with our photosystem 2. PS2 is actually the first that will act essentially. What is happening here is that you're taking your P680, so your photosystem 2 with the chlorophyll pigments, a photon will come in. Right? The photon will be absorbed and one of the electrons now, by chemically speaking, will go into the excited state. So it becomes a much better electron donor at this point. Right? In order to run this as a cycle, right, we have to get this back. Right? We have to recycle it because right, we want to take up a lot of photons to drive this electron transfer. So in order to actually bring back um, P680 to the ground state, Right. It's excited here, it will give away an electron. We'll see in a second where this goes, but it will transfer an electron to another molecule. So it, we generate this P60 plus molecule here. So it has lost an electron, it's partly positively charged. It wants its electron back. And so this regeneration actually occurs now with water. 
Water is a donor here of the electrons coming back to regenerate P680 into its ground state. And so this can now undergo another absorption of photon and so forth and so forth. So this can run continuously for as long as you have water to feed the electron back in. So where does this electron now go? This actually will go to a series of electron carriers. So I just define them as X here. There are a number of them. We won't look at too many of them. So they come in in their oxidized state. You're reducing them. So very similar, right, to the electron carriers of our um, mitochondrial ETC. And through a number of these reactions now, eventually for the photosystem two, we'll end up on our plastokinone carrier or PQ. So right, remember this is equivalent to your mitochondrial CoQ. It is a bit different here that where CoQ was a one plus one electron carrier, this one always needs two electrons and two hydrogens to do its job. So it's a two electron carrier. And so in this process, ultimately, the electron that has been transferred over from our pigment will go through this process of carriers and on reducing plastokinone to PK, PQH2, you reduce plastokinone. Now at the same time as this is happening, also PS1 is going through the same excitation using photons, so our P700 here, the same idea, we're absorbing photons, we're bringing P700 into the excited state to make it a good electron donor. Similar to before, we want to be able to recycle this whole system, right? As P700 is giving away an electron, it will be partially positively charged. We want to bring it back to the ground state by taking on another electron. And this will actually be a new carrier now that is plastocyanin or PC. That's actually a mobile copper protein, right? We have seen some of these copper proteins also in our mitochondrial ETC. Uh, chemically speaking, if you think about their job within the electron transfer chain, PC is equivalent to your mitochondrial cytochrome C, right, where we shifted our electrons between complex three and complex four. So it has a very similar function. It's a mobile protein that can transfer electrons. What it does, right, that electron that we are releasing here from our photosystem one, that now goes to different kinds of carriers. Again, here just highlighted as Y as a series of um, carriers. They get, they're getting reduced. And now the key carriers for photosystem one, first is our ferredoxin here, and our ultimate acceptor is now NADPH. So this is our reduced electron carrier as a final acceptor of electrons in our light reactions. So this is the biochemistry and how the photon energy is now used to bring about the transfer of electrons through this electron transfer chain, ultimately ending up at NADPH. But we want to, of course, understand how this works. How do we get to NADPH? Before we do so, Right. One important aspect to remember here, and we'll see it as in the next slide in a picture, is that linking now, right, your photosystem two and one, right, we're not using the same um, electron carriers here. It is linked to another cytochrome. It's called cytochrome B6F complex, and that actually connects your PC and your PQ. And so we'll see in a second how that actually works. Before we do so, I just want to zoom in um, into how this actually looks now in the molecule, right? So we are now in the chloroplast, right here. We are using our thylakids, right? All this electron transfer is happening in the membrane of the thylakid. And so we're zooming in here now into this membrane. Here we have, for example, your photosystem here. So these are these integral helices. I'm showing the structure right here, right? And just sort of zoomed in. So this purple part here would be these helices that are sitting right in the membrane. And you see here in green here, all these chlorophyll molecules that are bound to the protein. They're highlighted here just as green dots. And so their job essentially is 
in these outer rings of the protein, this chlorophyll molecule will be excited by the photon. It will give over its electron to another chlorophyll, another chlorophyll. We're moving gradually to the inside now of this photosystem. And then we get to actually what we call the reaction center. And we have two very special chlorophylls here. They are actually ultimately the ones that now are giving their electrons to the primary electron acceptor here. Okay. So similar to what we've seen before, where we have multiple, for example, iron sulfur clusters that allow these electrons to jump through these proteins and not get lost in the protein. We have a series of chlorophylls that bring, stepping from stone to stone essentially again, right, the electrons in to this very central chlorophyll that is our key point for now starting the electron transfer chain. So now let's look biochemically how this works, right? We've just seen this protein sitting in the membrane. I just sort of show it here as a schematic overview. So we want to look now at how PS2 and PS1 are working in conjunction, right? And how we can bring about the electron transfer. So we start here, right? We start at PS2, it will absorb light, right? It will give away electrons, right? We'll see that in a bit. And it will need to be recycled, right? We need to recycle our ground state of PS2 to keep the system going, to keep being able to take on photon energy. And we had said, right, we're using water as the electron donor. And what we're doing is actually we're splitting, we're cleaving water into protons and oxygen. And the electrons released in the splitting reaction, they will now be used to regenerate our ground state, PS2. Right? This process here is called photolysis, right? Lysis, cleaving water. The oxygen is what is being released, is what we are breathing in. Right? The protein that is actually associated here with PS2 that does it is called OAC or oxygen evolving complex because the most important part for us here, right, is generating oxygen. The most important part for the photosynthetic system are these electrons that we're needing to recycle our PS2. Now the electrons that have been transferred from PS2, they go to our PQ, our plastokinon. I just show the structure here. Again, similar to our CoQ, you have this hydrophobic tail side chain. And here you have your business end, the kinon, and you can take on electrons on both of these carbonyl groups, as well as hydrogens. You can reduce it to the hydroxy groups, exactly the same chemical logic as we had seen in CoQ. And again, I'm not asking you to understand the structure here, recognize it. I really want you to focus on just the principal reactions that are occurring here to transfer these electrons. So what we're doing, we're actually taking two plastokinons and reducing them. And that is important because plastokinon is a two electron carrier. But when we are splitting our water here, we actually are needing four electrons, right? In order to make oxygen, you need two waters to get to two molecules of oxygen that releases four electrons. And now to have a balanced stoichiometry, we need two plastokinons that can both take on two of these electrons. So keep in mind it's times two. We now have a reduced plastokinon here. Okay. Now again, right, at the same time, photosystem one is reacting. So this is happening at the same time. So this, unlike the mitochondrial ETC, this is not sort of a series of reactions left to right. Photosystem one and photosystem two are acting simultaneously. So light is coming in here now, right? PS1 is getting into an excited state. It's giving away its electrons through a series of carriers to ferrodoxin, and we're using four here. Again, we're working with four electrons here. This is being reduced, and those four electrons now in the reduced ferrodoxin, they can be transferred over to two molecules of NADP plus to generate two molecules of NADP. So every of these cycles is generating two molecules of NADPH. But we're not linked yet, right? So far, we just have two pieces here. We have our PS2 piece happening. We have our PS1 piece happening. But we haven't really recycled anything yet, right? We haven't recycled our 
PQ, right? In order to keep the cycling, we need our oxidated PQ. So keep that in mind. We need to link those two. Now let's have a look at how this linkage works. Right? First things first, right? We just had given away our electrons from photosystem one to ferrodoxin, ultimately to NADPH. We are recycling, we are regenerating the ground state of PS1 using our plastocyanin in its reduced form. We're using four because we're transferring four electrons. Right? Our plastocyanin is a one electron carrier. What it actually is, it's a small protein. It's a copper containing protein. So it's one of these metal containing electron carriers. It's a one electron carrier. So in order to have our overall stoichiometry of dealing with four electrons at a time, we need four of these reduced ones. They are being oxidized to the oxidized form of this protein, but we are regenerating the ground state of PS1. Okay. So it's great, right? We have our two electron carriers, PQ here and PC here, that are regenerating our photosystems. We can make our ultimate electron acceptor, NADPH, but we're still lacking the link between the photosystems, right? We have to now recycle these two key carriers, PC and PQ still have to be recycled to keep the system running. And so this is where your cytochrome B6F complex kicks in. This is a cytochrome complex. It looks very similar structurally to the cytochromes that we saw in our mitochondrial ETC. We won't look at the structure. It's just, it's very similar. And what it does now is that it actually will now use the reduced PQ. It will take the electrons from that. In the process, PQ is reoxidized. Now can be used again for regenerating PS2. The electrons now that have been re re um, released in this oxidation reaction of PQH2 will now be used to take your oxidized PC you will reduce it so you can keep using the reduced form of plastocyanin, your PC here, to regenerate your PS1. So the key linkage of making this a continuous flowing electron transfer is your cytosome B6F complex here that is taking care of regenerating both PC and PQ by transferring electrons between these two mobile carriers. So both of these carriers are mobile in the membrane can access the cytochrome complex, and there we can now regenerate both of them by transferring electrons from one to the other. Really, really nice and tight system again. This is what allows us to run photosystem one and two simultaneously and have this electron transfer occurring. Okay. And now much like what we had seen in the mitochondrial ETC, we're using the energy in this electron transfer to push protons across the membrane, right? And in this case, we're pushing them from the stroma into the lumen of the thylakoids, right? Unlike our mitochondrial ETC, we don't really do it at multiple of these complexes. It's actually happening here at your photosystem two. And the relevant players here are your plastokinon and your cytochrome B6F complex again. Okay. So if you're actually now looking at building this PMF gradient, so this proton gradient here in the lumen, there are multiple aspects happening, right? For once, similar to our mitochondrial ETC, we have four protons in the stroma that actually are pumped through the cytochrome complex into the lumen. And in addition, we have four protons here that we are taking up in the stroma. So these are the protons that are actually taking up in the reaction of reducing plastokinone. And so in the process of oxidizing plastokinone again, those four protons will actually be released into the lumen. So it's not a pumping mechanism. We're simply using an oxidation and reduction reaction to take four protons from the stroma and release them into the lumen. So that makes a total of eight. In addition, I keep in mind, we're doing photolysis here. And so photolysis, in addition to generating oxygen, is also generating additional protons here. Okay. So these add to the gradient, even though they're not part of the pumping. Right. But the principle is the same, right? We're using this electron transfer in addition to a photolysis to increase 
the gradient, the concentration of protons in the lumen as compared to the stroma, which is our PMF. Right, so this is just sort of now in the thylakoid membrane, a different way of showing this here. Right here, you have your thylakoid membrane, you have your um, photosystem here with the pigments, light is coming in, you're exciting the pigments, you're transferring the electrons across our ETC here, now very schematically shown. And ultimately, we do the same thing as what we have done in the mitochondrial ETC, right? This electron transfer will pump protons from the outside into the lumen of the thylakoid. You're increasing the gradation, the concentration and the gradient of protons. They can now flux spontaneously through your ATP synthase, just as we had discussed in the mitochondria. And you're using that energy now by the protons driving this rotor in the ATP synthase to make ATP. This is how we can use energy from light to drive electron transfer that drives proton gradient that drives ATP production, starting with light. And you need some water. All right, so this concludes our discussion on the light reactions, right? how we can actually make this ATP and our electron carrier in the reduced form NADPH. In the next video, we want to actually see how we use the ATP that was generated in the light reactions, how we use NADPH to actually make sugars.